Hello everyone and most welcome to H705. We have a beautiful snowy day here in Lindome, a bit south of Gothenburg. And apparently more snowflake is searching the ground. It's absolutely stunning. I mentioned this before but we have not been blessed with so much snow in ages here in the west coast. Thanks to the Gulf Stream, uh, we usually have rather bland and dark weather in November, December. Well, today I have happy news because I think I have sort of a solution to the perennial problem of the duality in the world. We mentioned in previous lecture that the world is actually non-dual one of the experimental proofs coming from quantum mechanics but also shown in uh, Gödel's theorems that the world is one and a whole but the problem seem to be that uh, our way of thinking is not whole or at least we try to make it not whole and then we have a problem and the problem is when the world is non-dual and our description of it is dual there is bound to be a conflict and what i would call misuse And I've written this as, you might photograph this because I really like this. This is coming from Stephen Rosen and Kalle pointed that out. It's wholeness cannot be described in positive terms only. If you have the whole and you try to describe it or fathom it in limited manner, that will erupt to a problem. But what is the solution then? Well, I will tell a story here as a start. And this, I'm afraid, is going to be yet another subject here to enlighten the all directions we already have. So we are going to put even more cards in our deck. More cards will mean we can play out loads more hands. There once was a monk who asked the Master Joshua in all earnest, I have just entered this monastery. I beg you, Master, give me instructions. Joshua asked, have you eaten your rice gruel yet? The monk answered, yes, I have. Joshua said, then wash your bowls. The monk attained some realization. And to give you a little hint, we do it by two steps. First, you try to understand and then you wash your bowl. You leave it. You leave the problem. And leaving the problem can also be going back to where we are most integrated. And that is the body. Because the body is always situated in the world and therefore it has traits of being inherently non-dual. So whereas our intellect, our thinking, our perception is going to be dual, that can be healed in the body or complemented maybe it's a better expression so it's a 
two-way action. And another way of approaching the problem is the one that's presented in the very famous book Gödel Escher Bach by Hofstadter. And he shows in that book where really cumbersome and tough exercises and thinking that we cannot, so to speak, observe the world from the outside. We cannot fix a coherent and consistent system that tells us about the world. You cannot be outside yourself. And that is in a drawing shown by Escher, his fantastic drawing, and I especially like the one where a hand is drawing another hand, and both hands are drawing each other. And the intellect will ask, who started? But I'd say the body understands. Inherently and implicitly, the body has an understanding. Of course, there cannot be a partial understanding of the world. But think about this, mind is also part of the world. It's not outside the world. So the partial can be complemented by what is already complementary, always more integrated, I'd say. So we help our mind by keeping balance. And this is, of course, something we learn through the lecture series. A balanced body gives a balanced mind. And that was a clue for me last night when I entered in, into this new area. So, we could say a combination of an outside order and a sort of strictness. We need to understand things in a certain way, but together with the body you will have complementarity and thereby knowledge, understanding. And then in a way we can have both paradoxical understanding and ordinary understanding at the same time. They seem to be as complementary as the word itself, like a particle and a wave. They go hand in hand, although, of course, they are absolute contradictions, completely, and in a way completely separated, because the particle Everything what a particle is, or the mind, is what the wave is not. They are the most absolute contradictions in the world. And they are completely individual, having nothing to do with each other. But this is the marvelous truth of quantum mechanics. Still they are connected. The world is still a whole. And this is what Stephen M. Rosen called the paradoxical ontological nature of the world. So the paradox is not ontic in our thinking process. It is the world actually, the very nature of world, the world that is paradoxical. And we need to find our path to knowledge still, even though the world is paradoxical.
This is what we know. We know about the paradoxality. It is a little bit like this. We can also think about thinking and action or word and world. But look here. World and word becomes the same in action. So they are separated from a certain perspective. It's almost like the ambigram. But from another perspective they are the same. And they are the same in the action. Because there is a thought guiding my action. When everything is fairly timed and functionable, there is a thought guiding my action. And here we have the complementarity of thinking and the world in the action. So one can say that in the bodily action, that's the only place where we can have a reconciliation of the contradiction. But nota bene, it doesn't mean that the contradiction disappears. It's rather this complementarity that is so different, but one can experience and this is the implicit knowledge the explicit will always be contradictory and it's supposed to be that way and we should accept and leave it at that but in the reconciliation in the complementarity they become the same There is reason to believe, and I found some hints. Uh, I've been looking for uh, GNAT and some other article groups that are very extensive, got millions of articles, papers, research. That, that the trauma, the amnesis that Heidegger calls it in Greek culture, was at the same time also a misuse or a lack of bodily action, lack of coordination. And as we mentioned yesterday, we were talking about S1 and S2, the two selves of Tim Galway, the inner tennis game, the inner, inner tennis player. And what he shows is how S1 is interfering with S2. S1 is the dominator, is the conscious part. But if it goes further and wants to meddle with the causes of S2, the acting agency, the action, the complementarity, to go into the complementarity, and sort of disrupts its function. That was possibly what happened in Greek society. There are some comments about people moving about less smoothly. And that seemed to happen somewhere in pre-Socratic time. Not the same level of coordination. So there is some sort of bodily equivalence to the amnesis of the antique Greek. And this is of course mental explanation of it to take the ex posteriori, the things that we already know, the things that we concluded, 
the explicit if you like it's almost explicit and applying it before the presencing started this is the same as the tennis player is just about to hit the ball and before the action comes to the ball the S1 or the trauma, traumatized consciousness disrupt the action. He's thinking already of hitting the ball before the club has gone to the ball. And this is this lack of synchronization. And this is actually mentioned in some commentaries. Someone has actually done a paper on it. I could not get it out. It's vastly interesting. It goes to show there was also a start of lack of coordination. In a little sense still, not very disruptive or effective, but the first start of it. But that is shown in the new way of describing the world. It's not as enticing anymore. Although the language gets more advanced and the descriptions gets, get much, much more pleasant. This is a pleasantry coming up. There is a development. But there is also a very, very small tendency still at that time to describe the words, the world in terms of being a bit more horrible. <laughs> it's not much, but it is there. It's obviously there, I'd say, even, but that's my point of view. What we want, of course, is that this wholeness should be both in space and time. So the thinking doesn't precede the action in that way. Try to grip what's happening, because the thought should lead the action. It should tell the body, push, 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 to the ball and hit the ball. That's what should be done. So it's a lack of synchronization, it's a lack of timing, it's a start of bad coordination. And at the very same time, it's this misunderstanding of the nature of reality. Because all of a sudden, everything that is this part should disappear because this part is the abyss of the emptiness that's the negative space that's the negative space that the body provides the background for the thoughts and it's also the thing that makes everything whole complementary So one could call this preemptive action with an easy word, where I want to do something before it's supposed to happen. I react before. And this is exactly what this fear and flight reflex does. It makes you react before, before thinking. And what happens is your actions won't be fitting the situation. It's like you have a preconceived picture of the world that is both static and has a sort of a time order that is in front of your eyes and that makes you do things you shouldn't be doing with your body, for instance. We, we talked about this before we move our hands before the back and then we hurt each other. Well, we hurt each ourselves, I mean. Could you even go so far? Last Saturday I thought, uh, talked with a chap, he got a uh, hernia and in my thinking hernia is caused by some brute thing, like a building block or a big rock. No, it was a, actually just a bag of 
purchase from the store. But what he did, of course, go to the action first with the hand. And then what you do with your back can cause havoc because you're not helping the back, you're making it much more difficult. That's the preemptive idea, to reach for the things before it's happening. So the trauma in the Greek is not only this idea of getting rid of the negative, getting rid of space, as Parmenides said, can be no empty space. Nothing is empty. Everything is full, 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 full. Um, what is more obvious when you read those times is that presencing is getting shut out. There's a lack of reality to the world. It's not as vivid because when you preemptively have an idea, you shut out what really comes to fore. You shut out presencing. You do not receive the world anymore. As I should receive the world through my feet now. Now I do it again. And I feel more present. Feel the ground. And that stabilizes me automatically. And the body movements, of course, they get discoordinated and maladjusted because they are no longer in the situation, in the flow. Well, many solutions to this problem has come during the ages, but one problem is this preemptive thought, this preemptive habit. It's so hard to break. It's so hard to break. We need to find a way to slow everything down. And the idea is to slow the body down because that is integrated. And when the body becomes so slow that the thought cannot be out of sync, it will begin to heal automatically. It's in the feedback system because the thought actually, in some sense, thinks it's doing the right thing. But when it slows down, the integration comes and you perceive with your whole system why it's wrong. And that's exactly the same reason a small child would never ever do that. The back would always be there because it's integrated with his body. It wouldn't hurt itself, of course. It doesn't happen. It's guided. And that's the S2. That's self number two. The doer, the actor, the one who knows how to do the acting. Self one still is needed to guide, to think, to plan, to enjoy. We need both. And that's in itself a paradox, but not unsolvable. With a prolonged practice, the system is healing itself and we get more help. We get physical, neurological help because it's a restructuring of the body as well when the muscle groups that are better builds up it becomes easier and easier to direct oneself because you will be able to do more precise movements muscle group t2 doesn't lend itself to precision it doesn't get precise t1 has precision and that means you can synchronize mind and body even more when you get this free gift of a better muscle group. So it becomes easier and easier.
and all of a sudden you start balancing up all by itself. You don't have to do anything. Balance is just there because it is actually completely natural part of the world. In a way, it's not a new thing at all. So there is a development in the body that will help this process. And all of a sudden, you can come to a realization that you can use your S1 whenever it's fitting, but then you start realizing maybe S1 should not take too firm a grip of the wholeness that let the dark side, the vacuum, the unconscious, the negative space be what it is with no interference and thereby I'm 100% sure both S1 will work much much better. That will be clearer, the thinking will be more ordered because it will see that each time something is done it's effective, it's successful and it begins to trust the process. You see, I leave the unconscious to do the things it needs to do. I saw last time it worked and I'm also really really satisfied with the results. So I leave the unconscious to do that. And once the unconscious, when the S2 can do its job, it will also get stronger. It will be better able to lead the movements. That will add also in the change in our neuromuscular pattern. We will have M1 and T1 growing more. And all of a sudden, the thinking process becomes clearer all by itself. You don't have to do anything. <clears throat> because you have been once upon a time as a child. Until we know, until the age of four or five, we don't have much misuse to talk about. <clears throat> then something happens. So, we could say that in childhood we do the same thing that historically was done to the Greek or the Greek done, did to themselves. But it's my firm conviction this can be wholeness once more because it used to be a wholeness and in many aspects, well, in all aspects, it is still wholeness. It's just we need to let both body and mind slowly understand that's the case and that that is the way to go about things to make them more elegant, salient and I'd say fantastic. I think this is a good time to round up. I'd say thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.